Uh, so good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Professor Karen Bryan and I'm the Vice Chancellor here at uh, York St. John. So on behalf of the university, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture of Professor Gary Chu. We were delighted to have Gary join our university community last year as Professor of Clinical Exercise Science. Since then, he has shared his wealth of experience alongside a clear passion for supporting the health and well-being of others with our colleagues, our students, and our partners. Gary has taken a leading role in supporting the growth of York St. John's research culture, spearheading the development of our new Institute for Health and Care Improvement, which will officially launch later this month. Ever since his undergraduate studies in sport and exercise science, Gary has shown a keen interest in the application of physical activity in healthcare. Gary's initial interest has grown into an impressive and, in and impactful academic career, spanning several universities and focusing on improving the evidence base for exercise training in the management of chronic disease. Gary has worked in collaboration with health professionals and patients with a determination to improve quality of life. Tonight gives us a unique opportunity to learn more about the highlights of Gary's work and the difference he is making in the field. I invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Chu to the stage. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for everyone for coming along tonight. It's a bit of a weird one, this. I've um, done, obviously, loads of presentation, presentations before, but this one's different. It's a time to reflect on things that have happened and, and where you want to go in the future. So it's been a really enjoyable experience kind of pulling together the presentation because it's, it's given that opportunity to reflect. I was a bit unsure of what to include, so I asked a few people and I consulted with ChatGPT as well. Um, I'm afraid, Lydia, there's not going to be any pet pictures. Um, but what, what you will get is a bit about my journey. So I'll kind of talk you through my, my academic journey mostly. Um, I'll tell you a bit about my research uh, and also future plans. And, and obviously, I've got a lot of people to thank you, people who I've worked with over the years as well. Uh, I do have a picture of my guinea pig on my phone. If you do want to see that later, so you can catch me in the, um, the drinks afterwards. Did anyone read the article about how the Students' Union at Cardiff University has started banning people who wear blue shirts and chinos? Anyone see that? I read that yesterday after spending lots of time thinking about what I should wear. Yeah. I don't have an extensive wardrobe, so I haven't had an opportunity to change, but I'm not a troublemaker. Um, don't associate me with that, and, and hopefully I've got something interesting for you to hear. So this infographic kind of maps my journey through academia. I'm a local lad, so I'm from, I spent most of my life living in York. I, I went to school in Strensel. I uh, did primary school there, secondary school in Huntington, and, and sixth form there as well. I was always very sporty, um, quite academic, I would say. Um, but by the end of my kind of sixth form A-levels, a uh, I wasn't really sure what to do. Um, so at that point, I didn't go straight into university. It took a couple of years out. And um, that kind of proved to be a good decision for a, a couple of... A, couple of main reasons, really. First and foremost, that it was around that time that I started the relationship with Natalie, my wife. Um, Natalie's here tonight with my three boys, Alex, Daniel, and, and Ben. Um, proud to say that now I've been with Natalie for 23 years, so I wouldn't have had that opportunity to, to get with her if I'd not had that year out. Um, and this is the first time that my family, uh, including my parents, Alan and Karen, have actually seen me do a presentation like this. 
this, so it's a, a little bit of a weird one for me. Besides that really important point, that, that study break, it, it gave me time to kind of grow up a little bit and find out a bit better about what I, I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. I spent most of that time working full-time in a local gym. Does anyone remember Courtney's? Yeah, a couple of nods. It's at Huntington Stadium, or, or used to be at Huntington Stadium. Um, and I worked there as an exercise instructor. And there was many aspects of that job which I, I really, really liked, um, particularly supporting people to improve their health and well-being. Um, but the hours and pay weren't great. Opportunities for career fresh progression weren't brilliant. Uh, and for me, it just wasn't mentally stimulating enough. So off I went to uni. I didn't go far. I did my first degree here at York St. John University in sport and exercise science a few years ago, and the, the university has changed a bit um, since then. Um, I spent a lot of my time at Hugh of Croft. Does anyone remember that? It's a housing estate now, so um, those kind of lecture rooms are, are long gone. Um, but it, it proved the right move. Um, I didn't really know what career I wanted at that stage, but I was into sport, I was into exercise, and it allowed me kind of to start to study those subjects a little bit more and the science of that. Um, I got the academic bug a little bit. So I went on to do a master's and a PhD, both at Sheffield Howard University. And I started to specialize a little bit after that. So sport and exercise science is quite a broad church. It includes lots of little subject uh, disciplines. I was more always orientated towards physiology. So my master's was in sport and exercise physiology. And then I went on to do a, a PhD in clinical exercise physiology. I was more sporty to begin with. My, my first taste of research was in my undergraduate degree um, here. And I did a dissertation about pacing strategies in triathlon. Um, I was then doing um, a lot of support work with local teams. So I was doing strength and conditioning support work for York City Knights. Um, also for Sheffield Wednesday Academy and, and Durham County Cricket Club. And they were great experiences, but alongside that, I was doing more exercise and health stuff. And slowly over time, I kind of merged slightly towards health and less, of, and less from sport. And there was a couple of reasons for that. I still love sport. I'm a really, really sporty person. Um, but when I was working at so a few reasons. One of the reasons was when I was working at Sheffield Wednesday, the manager at the time, Chris Turner, got sacked. And at that point, his, his whole support staff just got wiped out overnight. And it was kind of a bit of an eye-opener to me as a kind of young adult about how quickly the world can change in that environment and how unstable it can potentially be working in, in professional sport. Um, so that kind of put me off a little bit. Um, but also... I think I felt like I was enjoying working with the general public a little bit more than professional sports people who it's great to work with and lots of brilliant people but often weren't as appreciative for the sport that you gave them than, than the general public who felt like generally were. Um, that's a bit of a generalisation and uh, I, I love lots of aspects of the work that I did over that time. But a few things like that just kind of made me want to move a little bit more towards the health field. My PhD at Sheffield Hallam was about exercise rehabilitation for people with peripheral artery disease. Uh, and since then, I, I've worked in lots of different clinical conditions, trying to understand the role of exercise and physical activity in supporting people. At the end of my PhD, I was lucky to be offered the opportunity to go and work abroad. I got offered a postdoctoral position at Penn State University. Um, I could have gone for quite a, a long time, but at the time, um, me and Natalie were starting a family. So what could have been like going for the long term changed into kind of a 12-week um, short stay in the end. Still a great experience, um, but slightly different. often wonder what life would have been like if if we'd gone and taken that opportunity and gone a bit longer. Really happy with how it's panned out with the kind of route taken here. So I stayed at Sheffield Hallam for four years. In 2013, I think I got a bit fed up of commuting and just felt like I needed a change. So York has always been my base and I've, I've kind of commuted to a, different, a few different places. 
um, got a job at the University of York, uh, and that offered a very different role. Um, I wasn't working particularly in physical activity and health in that role there. I went to work at York Trials Unit, which is a, a clinical trials unit. And that was really good for my um, kind of furthering my research development. I got to work on a couple of really big multi-site randomized controlled trials. One was a surgical trial about the best way to treat a scaphoid fracture, so a bone in your hand. If you fall over, you often break your scaphoid bone. Is it better to surgically fixate that or just do conservative management? So it kind of helped coordinate a big trial of that. And also worked on a big a drug, tri drug trial as well called PROMOTE, which is about methotrexate for people with hand OA, or osteoarthritis. So that offered some really different um, development opportunities, made some really good contacts in my time there. A couple of years, Northumbria came knocking, got the opportunity for getting back into a, a sport exercise job again, um, and a big promotion opportunity. So they offered me, at the time, it was a readership, but they changed the title to associate professor soon after moving there. So big um, promotion opportunity, but again, a different development opportunity. So it, it was a bit more teaching focused. Up until that point, I'd been more kind of research intensive roles. And that one was more of this kind of mixed academic role, teaching and research and a heavy dose of admin as well. Um, so very different again, stayed there for seven years and then um, last year or so been back. So it comes full circle back to York St. John where it all began. Um, I want to thank Andy Hill for um, getting in touch and uh, we met a few times to kind of talk about the potential for me to come back um, and um, helping shape it into a role which I see as an ideal role for me. So I'm back in a more teaching focused role, um, an opportunity to lead a research institute, that kind of opportunity doesn't come along that often. So yeah, a brilliant opportunity to develop something and really take research to a, another level here. Um, we're starting to build a, a great team in the institute and, and to be part of shaping that is a, a really great opportunity. Um, and, and still relatively young. So I've actually been a professor for two years now. So uh, I got my professorship at Northumbria um, when I was 39, which is relatively young to be a professor. So I'm really grateful uh, of getting it so um, early in a way. Um, but I think it, I see it as recognition for many years of graft. Um, so I'm a, a hard worker. Um, try, and, try and do that in, in every aspect of, of, of what I do here, but in life generally, a bit of a grafter. Um, and I, I've lost my chain of thought, so I'm going <laughs> to move on to the next slide. Anyway, the, the golden thread that has kind of been there all the way through over the last 20 years or so is this um, interest in the role of physical activity in the management of long-term long conditions. So initially as a practitioner, an exercise instructor, a personal trainer, supporting people to be more active and improving their health and well-being. Um, over time, went more research and then more research and teaching combined. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a bit more about this area now. So we've had a bit about my journey. I'm going to talk a bit more about physical activity, define some terms as we do as academics, uh, and then bring my research into it and show some of the highlights. So what is physical activity? Um, so a common definition, which we often hear, is it defined as any bodily movements produced by our skeletal muscles which result in energy expenditure. There's different ways in which physical activity can be classified. It can be classified as structured, so often thought of as exercise, so structured physical activity is another way of describing exercise, which is more planned purposeful activities which are typically done for the purpose of improving health and fitness or can be classified as incidental, which are kind of unplanned physical activities. The types of movements and, and activities which you might undertake in your um, transportation, during your work, um, during domestic activities, 
um, so other things um, outside of more structured exercise. It's good to think of the different domains and ways of classing physical activity when you're thinking about researching this because different types, so the association between occupational physical activity and health outcomes is not necessarily the same as the relationship between leisure time and physical activity and health outcomes because the types of activities involved and the stresses and strains that may be placed on the body of doing those activities are not necessarily the same. So sometimes as a researcher in this space, it's useful to classify things into the specific domains, but also the dimensions as well. So mode, frequency, duration, intensity, sometimes called fit, frequency, intensity, type, type and time. And there are different ways of kind of um, dicing up physical activity. And these are the things that, some of the things I have to wrestle with as a researcher. And also, how best do you measure some of these different aspects? We have questionnaires and we have more objective tools for, for measuring these things. So a lot of work has gone on to try and determine how much physical activity is important for health. Um, various countries have attempted to synthesize the evidence and come up with recommendations. And this is an infographic from the World Health Organization, which was produced a couple of years ago in their recent update, their physical activity guidelines. So it's a little bit busy, so I'll just walk you through it. So working from left to right, these are the recommendations. And you can see in the box that it changes slightly depending on the subgroups we're thinking about. So everybody should try and limit the amount of sedentary time. So sedentary time is often thought of as sitting. That's often how it's operationalized. So sitting or lying with low le uh, levels of energy expenditure, that's sedentary behavior. So we want to try and limit or break up our sedentary time, says someone who spends a lot of his time sat at a desk. Um, we should try and replace that with some physical activity, and there's this message of any is better than none. For adults and older adults, there's this threshold of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity. So if you think of a, a brisk walk, that is a common example of a, a moderate intensity physical activity for a, a, general, a kind of average adult. So activities which get you a slightly, you know, heart rate raised slightly, maybe a little bit sweaty. If you're doing the talk test, you can hold a conversation whilst you're doing it, but maybe not be able to sit. That kind of level of intensity is moderate. So we try and accumulate 150 minutes of that at least per week, and we can hope to um, get a range of health benefits from doing that. If you're a child or an adolescent, then the guidelines are slightly different, and they aim for 60 minutes on average per day across the week. 60 minutes per day, that is. Adults and older adults have these additional um, mentioned there about strengthening and, and other activities to develop balance and strength. So two or three days per week, whether you're adult or older adult. And there's this appreciation of a dose response effect. So any is better than none. 150 minutes is great because that's a kind of key threshold. But if you can do more, then even better. And if you can get above 300 minutes per week, then, then that's great. So how active are we as a nation? We have different surveys which go on, and this is some data from something called the Active Lives Survey, which is um, managed um, and delivered annually by Sport England. So what they um, do, or, or did the last call at least, was to take a, a random sample of households in England and ask them about their activity patterns. So it, involved 175,000 people, so it's a big nationally rep representative survey. In the top box, you can see that a quarter of adults don't, uh, are classed as inactive, so do less than 30 minutes per, per, uh, per week, rather, of um, moderate intensity physical activity. The other side of that line, we've got 63%, or nearly two-thirds of the adults who meet that 150 um, minute threshold. In terms of muscle strengthening activity, the picture isn't quite as good, 
So only 44% of adults report doing two plus sessions per week. Question to you. So we can drill down into locality data. York as a city, would you say York is more active than the national picture? So if you think York is higher than the national average in terms of the physical activity levels, I'd like to raise your hand now. So the majority, I think, are yes, and the majority is right. So as a, a city, we're one of the most um, active cities in England, actually. So 75% of adults in York are classed as physically active, meeting that 150 minute per day target. Slightly trickier question now. Globally, in adults, what percentage of adults do you think meet the combined guidelines? So achieve the aerobic guidelines and the muscle strengthening guidelines. Does anyone want to be brave and take a, a punt at the number? Very close, Jerry. Very close. It's 17%, one seventh. So to begin with, the top of the slide is kind of a reasonably positive bit picture. But when you think of the combined guidelines, only kind of one in five adults are kind of meeting that aerobic and strength. Um, so potentially not getting all, uh, the combined health benefits of, of doing both of those things. So room for improvement and keep people like me in the job because there is room for improvement. Okay. <coughs> kind of alluded to benefits of physical activity. So this slide is an attempt to try and summarize, summarize some of the wide ranging benefits which could be had from being reg regularly active. This is from... Um, our UK physical activity guidelines from the Department of Health and Social Care. You can see in the middle, there's some labels to kind of identify the, the broad areas in which benefits can be received. We, I guess, tend to think mostly of kind of physical and mental. But when you work your way around kind of potential for individual de developmental opportunities, social, community development, think things like park run, economic development as well, so by being physically active, that could maybe um, reduce strain on the NHS. Think of like the business involved in sport, football in particular in our country, really big business. There's a, a whole range of potential benefits um, to be had from being physically active, and lots of different spaces to work within in this area just highlighted my area, so lots of other physical activity research has covered some of the different patches. Most of my work has been around the management of medical conditions, though. As I say, I didn't create this infographic, and I don't particularly like where that box is situated on here, because it puts it next to physical well-being, which is not really just related to that in terms of long-term medical um, mental health conditions. What, why would it be positioned there? Um, but so I didn't, I didn't. We'll just think about long-term conditions now. So a definition is commonly used as a health problem that cannot be cured, but can be managed with medications or other treatments. Lots of different long-term conditions. It's just a, a flavor of the view there. So diabetes, arthritis, high blood pressure, and so on. Lots of people have long-term conditions. In the UK, it's estimated around 26 million people um, have one or more long-term condition. And the burden can be quite substantial on the individual. It can reduce quality of life, out-of-pocket expenses. It can be medication burden, polypharmacy. It can lead to problems with being able to work. The symptoms associated with the condition and for your toll on carers as well. There's a large economic burden as well. The treatment and care of people with long-term conditions is estimated to take around £7 for every £10 of total health and social care expenditure. So there's a, a massive burden, patient and kind of wide societal burden of long-term conditions in our country and other countries across the world. So bringing physical activity and long-term conditions together, 
moving a bit towards my space now. So what recommendations do clinical guidelines make about physical activity in the management of long-term conditions? It's quite a busy slide, so I'll walk you through it. So what you can see is a really big list of different conditions grouped according to how they are grouped in the quality and outcomes framework. For each of these conditions, there exists a clinical guideline on the management of that condition. So not limited specifically to physical activity, just generally uh, a guide for doctors in, the, in England for how they should manage that condition. So there's a nice guideline for the management of atrial fibrillation, nice guideline for the management of hypertension and so on. So what I did, I scoured all of the clinical guidelines for all of these 28 different conditions for any recommendations that were related to physical activity. Where there's a red cross, there was no recommendations for physical activity. Where there's an orange tick, there was a recommendation for physical activity to be promoted, so like give advice maybe. And where there's a green tick, there was a recommendation for physical activity to be delivered. Um, either by that service or by referring on to a, another physical activity program. This is just an overview. Um, and it's to give the picture that it is quite a bit of a mixed picture. So some, there's no recommendations. Some, there's some recommendations, but the, the recommendation varies. Now, it doesn't tell us the detail. So if there's not a recommendation, it doesn't mean there's not necessarily a role. It might be that there just isn't the evidence there for NICE to make a recommendation at the moment. So the detail's important, but it's just to give an overview that the picture is mixed and the role is not necessarily the same by these different conditions. We can't just say physical activity is good for everything uh, and offer it widely, particularly in a, uh, a cash-strapped NHS, which can't do that. So trying to delve a bit deeper into the underpinning evidence, there's lots of places you could potentially look if you wanted to understand the evidence for physical activity or exercise in a specific condition. One of the better places to start would be a high quality systematic review. So rather than looking at individual studies, what a systematic review should do is pull to together all of the relevant studies on a particular topic and then try and synthesize them in a way, and sometimes use techniques like meta-analysis to, to show what the average effect is. So for example, there might be a systematic review on exercise for intermittent qualification. And within that, it might pull together all the relevant studies and then try and work out what's the average effect of exercise versus control on walking distances or some other outcome. And that could be a really useful Kind of way of finding what studies have been done and what is the average effect if a meta-analysis has been done. There's different quality um, levels of quality for systematic reviews as there are for many other types of studies. Cochrane systematic reviews are considered to be one of the gold, like the gold standard because they're methodologically rigorous and undergo quite a, a high level of scrutiny before they even started. Within Cochrane systematic reviews, they have this thing called the summary of findings table, which kind of summarizes all the main findings, basically. Shows that for this, a particular question, by outcome, what is the effect? How many studies and participants contributed to the outcome? And how certain is the evidence? And this table kind of touches on that point about certainty. The next slide is a summary of certainty data, so I needed to introduce the idea. So if a systematic review has worked out the effect of exercise on this outcome is, say, a medium effect, the next thing is to say the level of certainty of that effect is either high, moderate, low, or very low. If it's very low, then we have very little confidence in that estimate. And if we did more studies, that effect value would probably change quite a bit one way or the other. So it's not very reliable. If it's high certainty, then future studies are unlikely to change the picture. And we've got a good sense of what the effect is. How certain is the evidence 
the exercise and long-term conditions. So of the 28, systematic, uh, 28 long-term conditions I listed, I found a Cochrane systematic review for 21 of them. Across those 21 systematic, uh, Cochrane systematic reviews that included the grade certainty approach, there was 138 different outcomes that have been assessed. The main headline point I'm trying to make is in the middle of this table. If you look at the certainty level, only 9% of the outcomes were, which were assessed across all of these systematic reviews were considered to be high certainty. A very large chunk were either low or very low or not reported, so there wasn't enough data to even do a meta-analysis. So the situation we have is that We've got a sense of what works in terms of physical activity and conditions, uh, physical activity and, and long, some long-term conditions, enough to make recommendations and nice guidelines. But in many places, the underpinning evidence isn't as good as where you would hope it would be. So the role of physical activity varies by conditions. Many uncertainties exist. That last slide just related to effects in terms of benefits, but there's lots of areas of other, other areas of uncertainty. So harms, what is the optimal intervention? Is it good value for money? What are the experiences of people taking part? My goal as a researcher is to try and address some of these uncertainties. Um, I'll never cover it all. I won't have a, enough time in my life to do that. So I just want to try and pick off some of these, going to address some of these things through my research, improve the evidence base in some spaces, um, and hopefully it'll make a positive difference and um, can look back and think I've done something good. That list at the bottom is the list of the conditions I've published studies in. So I had the privilege of learning a lot about lots of different conditions by, by working across lots of different spaces. Didn't plan for it to be like that, I think coming out of my PhD in, in peripheral artery disease, I had the plan, right, I've got loads of studies I want to do in that space. And then things happened, opportunities presented themselves, and I said yes, probably too many times, and it kind of branched and worked in lots of different spaces. Um, but I'm glad I did. Um, got to meet loads and loads of new people and do a whole variety of different studies. So I'm just going to present a couple of areas of work which are done, which kind of I'm particularly proud of. This work here was kind of related to my PhD. So I mentioned intermittent claudication. What is that? So um, some people have developed this condition called peripheral artery disease. That's where the blood vessels supplying the periphery of the body. So the main blood vessels outside of the heart and the brain, they can become harder and third. Um, so big risk factors for that are smoking, diabetes in particular, um, something that's more common in older age. A key symptom of this is called intermittent claudication, and it presents mostly as a cramp-like leg pain. So if you imagine the blood vessels supplying the muscles in your leg becoming a bit narrower, when you walk and the blood, like the oxygen, um, the demand of the muscles kind of moving you, the oxygen demand goes up. But the ability to deliver oxygen and, and kind of fresh blood to the muscles is limited because you've got narrowed arteries. And there's a mismatch there, and that causes this cramp-like leg pain, which is called intermittent claudication. It can be very debilitating. People can only walk a few meters before they get this cramping pain in their leg. It has a really big impact on quality of life. Goals of treatment is to improve symptoms and reduce cardiovascular risk. And one way to do that is supervised exercise training. So referring to a previous slide, peripheral artery disease had an orange tick and it had a green tick. We know supervised exercise works for this condition. It improves people's walking ability and quality of life. We've got an implementation problem though. We know it works, but it's not very well implemented. Um, so less than half of the vascular units in the UK have access to a supervised program, despite it being there in the national guidelines. So I've done lots of different studies in this space. In my PhD, I was looking at doing arm cranking 
as an alternative exercise modality to improve walking distances in, in people with this condition. After my PhD, I did some more behavioral type work, um, so trying to develop a behavior change intervention to promote self-managed physical activity. It's called the CEDRIC program, which has been adopted in a couple of trusts around the country. Developed expert statements, one for the British Association of Sport and Exercise Science about how to do it, how to, to implement exercise. We've, I've been a co-author on a European guideline, which has just been accepted for publication in the European Heart Journal recently. We've developed infographics and tools for people to use. That infographic has now been produced in, I think, 17 different languages and is used widely, different trusts in the UK and beyond. And one of the most proud things is that I've been working with Andy Thompson and, and Lisa Sharp, who are both here tonight, to set up a York-based supervised exercise program. So I mentioned the 50% not offering it. York was one of those sites in the UK who didn't have a, a program until about two weeks ago when we've launched our collaborative supervised exercise program that people in the York area can come to York St. John facilities, get a 12-week supervised exercise program, which will hopefully improve their symptoms and mean that they don't have to go on to more invasive approaches to in improve their symptoms. So hopefully leading them to cost saving and reduce burden on the NHS. Another program I've been, uh, project I've been particularly proud of, so uh, I was lucky to land the big national trial. Um, so these were really hard to land. Um, this was funded by the National Institute for Health and Care Improvement. And this um, work has just kind of come to a, a finish recently. And it's something I've been working on for several years. We do like pilot projects to get pilot data and then we put in grant applications and sometimes they get rejected. But this is one that got through and we got to do the big trial that we wanted to do initially. Um, so the last four years have been doing a, a big national trial of yoga for people with long-term conditions. Um, a lot of the guidelines I've referred to previously are based on evidence, which is research for people with single conditions. We don't have a very well-developed evidence base for people with long-term conditions, uh, multiple long-term conditions. And many people live with multiple two or more long-term conditions, so we need to develop our evidence base for, the, for that specific group. Yoga might be a good candidate intervention for people with multiple long-term conditions because it can improve various different aspects of health and well-being and has the potential to play a role in the management of several different conditions. So it seemed a good thing to test in a clinical trial. Been lots of studies of yoga, but none in this specific group, and many are quite methodologically not great. So lots of small studies, no economic evaluations, no longer term follow-up. We have tried to address some of those issues with this study. So it's very difficult to summarize four years of work in one slide, but we're going to try and give you the headline finding from this trial. The paper, uh, the report's been accepted and the paper's been accepted, the main study paper, results paper has been accepted, so I can give more detail. But the headline finding is that offering a 12-week program of a chair, it was a chair-based yoga program, which is owned by the British Wheel of Yoga called Gentle Years Yoga, sadly did not improve quality of life over 12 months, which was our primary outcome. We had several secondary outcomes, and it didn't lead to an improvement in any of those as well. Depression, anxiety, loneliness, falls. Um, on a slightly more positive note, there were very few adverse events, so it appeared safe. People seemed to like it, um, so we did interviews and, and seemed to quite enjoy it. We did an economic evaluation, and this is quite weird, it showed to be probably cost effective. So not clinically effective, but probably cost effective. Now, what does a commissioner do with that? That's a tricky one. Um, time will tell. Um, we think there's probably not enough in our data for people to start, for commissioners to start commissioning yoga and giving out free classes on the NHS. Um, 
but there's other ways in which it could be promoted. So if a, a, a GP had someone in front of them who they thought yoga fits their needs and preferences, then they could maybe through a social prescribing link worker recommend that they do it on a self-pay basis. So it could be promoted but not covered on the NHS. And that's probably where we see, see it fitting on the basis of our results. Um, I can give more detail if you're interested. Looking to the future now. I'll try and wrap up soon for questions. So I mentioned I've given the opportunity to set up and direct a research institute. So this is called the Institute for Health and Care Improvement. We're launching formally at the end of this month, so we'll have another event here. Um, hopefully see some of you again for that. This really brings together all of the university's work in health and social care research. There's lots of research groups doing great work already. The Institute is a cross-university thing, which is like an umbrella type thing, and a front door for the University for Health and Social Care Research. We're building a team. So we've got a core staff who are kind of building an activity, a, a range of activities which will help take our research to the next level. We've got things like research showcase events. We're growing our PGR community um, and working with our kind of collaborators to get kind of clinical PhDs, more of those in. More binning activities, there's more projects going underway, We're developing a new research and evaluation service. So you can find out lots more about that on the link there and, and hopefully at, at the launch event. Um, lots of to come. I think this next year is the, the first year it's going to really get going and, and really see the impact of, of what this institute can offer. So part of my time will be as research institute director, part will be as researcher, lucky to be involved in, in several ongoing projects. See some members of the SPACES team down at the front. So SPACES is a, a long-term program of work funded by NIHR. It's about developing and testing physical activity interventions for people with severe mental illness. Working with York and Scarborough Trust, doing some work, kind of supporting them develop their Scarborough Research Hub. So it's about growing research capacity and capability on the East Coast. Mentioned the Supervised Exercise Programme, working with Simon Davies, um, doing a project about the immune response to exercise, and doing some work, more work, um, with Leah, Dave, Jerry, James and Co. on the, the iPrep World Programme, which is developing and, and testing an online intervention to improve people's fitness in the lead up to major surgery. So a real range of things um, which hopefully make a, a practical difference down the line. I want to say a few thank yous before I kind of wrap up. There's been a lot of people who have been very influential in my career. It's a bit awkward at this stage because the potential to miss people out. Um, so I, I really hope I haven't, but there's, um, I'll try and name loads of people in, in the uh, attempt to not miss anyone out. Um, you can read them. Some are mentors, some are people who have supported me in, in kind of developing roles in different ways. Really, really grateful. Wouldn't be here without being able to work with so many amazing people. A great part of my job as well is to support the development of new researchers. Um, so I've had seven PhD students over the years who have now gone on to be a doctor themselves. I've got two current students. Thank you for coming. Um, Ruth and Lisa, so Ruth's doing her PhD about delaying and reversing frailty in rural communities. Lisa's working, doing a master's by research around the, the exercise, the qualification exercise service. What's the feasibility of setting that up in York? Um, hope to get some more students soon. I've got a student ship that's being advertised at the moment around the certainty of evidence in long-term conditions, building on that initial work I've, I've presented. So if you know any good students, point them my way, please. And lots of funders and lots of co-authors along the way. As I said, there was a lot of people to mention, so I've learned how to generate a word cloud for the first time to, to try and name them all. Some final thoughts. Bring it back to the topic of the talk. So, Despite numerous uncertainties, physical activity has 
and established an important role in the management of many health conditions. The benefits of regular physical activity can be wide, wide ranging and usually far outweigh the risks. Everyone has their own starting point. Begin there and build up gradually. Some is better than none. Thank you for listening. So there, I think, is about 10 minutes for questions. Rob, you're not allowed to ask, because you've already told me you'd ask a difficult one. Um, we have roaming mics, so if you want to ask a question, please stick your hand up, and then wait for the mic to get to you, and then ask your question. I'm not sure if the mic's working. Sorry, like to say Slight technical glitch. People are moving quick, so uh, hopefully be sorted. I've seen quite a few physical activity talks where the person at the front gets everyone moving. I, I'm not one of those guys. I'm not going to do it. If you've ever seen me do a step aerobics class, it's, it's quite a fright. So, uh... So, in a lot of studies like this, you assign something as it's called the primary outcome, the main outcome. So, our main outcome was quality of life, health related quality of life. There's lots of different tools that you can use to measure health-related quality of life. Um, we chose to use something called the EQ5D, which is commonly used in economic evaluations to inform NICE guidelines. So it's a widely used tool, particularly in the UK. It asks you questions about different domains, like ability to do daily activities, mental well-being, mobility. And then it pulls together all your responses into a single score, a health utility score. And we use that as our kind of main outcome measure. There was a bit of uncertainty about whether that would be the best thing to use. So we included lots of other measures as well so that we could capture other things. But also we had a secondary quality of life outcome measure, which was called the Promise 29, which is a tool that's been developed more in the States. And we validated that as a, a sub-study. So yeah, we had measures for depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-reported falls. We measured medication use and healthcare resource use based on mostly on self-reports. Um, I probably missed something, but I, I think they were the main things we, we looked at in that study. Jerry, I think we've got a mic now. Is that working? It is. So I've got a, a little story to tell about Gary, who I've worked with for about 15 years. <laughs> as a research collaborator. So Gary and I first worked together on um, 
a high intensity exercise training program for abdominal aortic aneurysm surgery. And um, Gary was kind of the new kid on the block at the time. And his, his um, determination and aspiration was very clear from the outset, but I was a bit concerned about his staying power. And as we were about to put in the NIHR grant application to the research for patient benefit, um, Gary kind of said to me, look, Jerry, and he, he'll deny remembering this, but he's well remembered it. He said, I think I'm probably the better person to lead this application, not you. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is true, but what I will say, so that was, that I remember that, and look where he's gone now, that's absolutely fantastic, so he clearly had the, the right aspirations at that point. Did I say that? You did, yes, but that's fine. I never harbored any ill feeling about that, that's Gary. Really I thought it was idea. well placed. Um, but then when we were actually doing the application and the kind of burning the midnight, midnight, midnight oil, and there was quite a big group of us in, in the evening and we were reaching the deadline, and everybody else had dropped off. And Gary was staying with me. We were emailing each other, filling in the last section on the form. And at 10 to 12, midnight, he disappeared. I'm going to bed. That's why I was worried about his staying power. I was up till 2 a.m. and he left me at 10 as well. But congratulations, Gary, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I normally shut down at about 10 o'clock and that's, that's bedtime. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, Gary. Hi, uh, by my calculations, it took you 10 years from graduating with a PhD to being a prof which is extremely impressive. What advice would you give to any current PhD students? What one piece of advice would you give them if they're following your route in academia? One piece of advice. Um, so, can I be naughty and give a few? Um, so, I, I published quite early. I, I published my undergraduate dissertation, which I think is quite rare. And, um, I continue to write. I published my master's dissertation, a few papers from my PhD, and just kept publishing loads. Um, so it's quite good our academic currency. Um, having papers, it, it gets you places, but it, it opens doors as well. It's not the only thing. Um, and linked to that, being able to write loads of papers was through collaborating with lots of people. Um, the type of work I do, it, it needs to involve collaboration. If it involves patient groups, I, I can't, I don't have the clinical understanding to give that clinical oversight. So I have to work with clinical collaborators who, who often have the access to those populations as well. So collaborating with lots of people, learning and, and kind of benefiting from those networks has been really important to me. So some of the slides summarizing some of the people I've worked with. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those collaborations. So yeah, writing a lot, working hard, collaborating a lot. There's three. That's for one, not giving you three. <laughs> Andy? Yeah, I guess a bit of a bugbear is that this kind of sense of maybe thinking that exercise is, is good for everything. It's kind of a panacea. I think when you drill into the detail in many of the conditions, the evidence base is, is not that good. And I, I don't think that's a good way to base health and care on kind of shoddy evidence. So I think there is the opportunity in lots of different conditions to do more. Um, I think if I had to pick a particular area that I'd really want to work in, um, I'm drawn towards vascular because that's <laughs> what I've done most in uh, and what I know most about. Um, but yeah, there's, there's loads of room for improvement. 
there's been quite a lot of good initiatives to kind of prioritize research topics. So James Lind Alliance has done some work and you can kind of pick through those and exercise and physical activity features in, in several different top tens. So I think there's a lot to be done. Chal challenges funding, like securing funding to do decent pieces of work is not easy and there's only so much money to go around. So um, I guess I've got to work with some of the great people in, in the audience to try and put in competitive applications against different areas of healthcare which are trying to get funded as well. So I don't think I pinpointed one particular, but we said vascular, we'll get to vascular. How are we doing for time? I think we might be around time to wrap up and go and have a drink. 